Hello and welcome to Lever Time, the flagship podcast from The Lever, an independent investigative news outlet. I'm your host, Frank Capello. David Sirota is off today, but we'll be back next week. On today's show, we will be talking about the huge story from the past two weeks, the Norfolk Southern train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. If you've been following this story, you know that the derailment and the ensuing chemical explosion may end up being one of the most severe environmental disasters in U.S. history. Today, I'll be speaking with the Levers reporters whose tireless efforts to report on this story has actually driven the national conversation and put immense public pressure on elected officials. It's an extremely important story, and we're going to be going through the entirety of how it has all played out. This week, our paid subscribers will also get a bonus segment. I'll be speaking with independent journalist John Russell, who has been on the ground in East Palestine for the last couple of weeks, speaking with railroad workers and union leaders about how this disaster unfolded and what can be done to prevent them from occurring in the future. If you'd like access to Lever Time Premium, you can head over to levernews.com to become a supporting subscriber, giving you access to all of the Lever's premium content, and you will be directly supporting the investigative journalism that we do here. Speaking of which, if you're looking for other ways to support our work, you can share our reporting with your friends and family. You can leave this podcast a rating and review on your podcast player. Because the only way that independent media grows is by word of mouth, and we need all of the help we can get to combat the inane bullshit that is corporate media. All right, so we're going to get right into our main story today, which is the Norfolk Southern train derailment. So just a little bit of background. If you haven't been following the story, on February 3rd, a freight train carrying hazardous chemicals, including vinyl chloride, derailed in the town of East Palestine, Ohio. And the vinyl chloride that was on board was ignited in a controlled release. Now, as we reported at the lever, the rail industry helped kill a federal safety rule which was aimed at upgrading the rail industry's braking systems. We also reported how industry lobbyists convinced regulators to exempt trains like this one that derailed from being regulated as, quote, high hazard flammable trains. Now, since the publishing of that original story, the Levers reporting has been driving national conversation and the public pressure campaign on transportation officials to do their job and to properly regulate the multi-billion dollar railroad industry. This is why independent investigative journalism is so important in today's corporate media landscape. And the Lever has shown what kind of real world impact that we can have. So to help break all of this down, I will now be joined by the Levers reporters who have been working very, very hard over the last two weeks to provide the type of detailed context that explains how a disaster like this can occur, who has the power to make sure it doesn't happen again in the future, and how accountability journalism can actually make a difference. All right, I am now joined by the Levers, Julia Rock, Rebecca Burns, and Matthew Cunningham Cook. Thank you all so much for joining me today. So glad to be here, Frank. Hey, Frank. Thanks so much for having me on, Frank. <laughs> all right, so I want to talk to the three of you, not just about this story, but about the entire process of how and why the Lever has been reporting on it. I think it's going to be very useful for our audience to learn a little bit more about how real accountability journalism gets done, and in this case, how it has had a real-world impact in driving national conversation and pressuring elected officials, namely Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg, uh, to actually do their jobs and regulate these giant industries. So we're going to go through the entire last two and a half weeks of how everything unfolded. Let's start at the beginning. The derailment took place on February 3rd, and your first story was published by The Lever on February 8th. So when did you all realize that this story was being underreported by corporate media? And what was the first bit of information that you discovered that made you realize that there was a story to tell about the railroad companies and their lobbying influence? 
Right. So the derailment happened on a Friday evening. There really wasn't much coverage um, aside from local coverage at first, but the local coverage coming out was pretty horrifying. There were reports from first responders, um, you know, describing the fact that they arrived at the scene of the accident to find a chemical smell permeating the air, but had no available information about what chemicals uh, they were dealing with. Um, and then, of course, over the weekend, there was this evacuation order of just from Ohio and Pennsylvania governors telling people, you know, leave your homes immediately. There could be an explosion. Um, and that's concerning, to say the least. Uh, so, you know, by the time uh, Monday rolled around, um, I think both Matthew and David had kind of flagged this as a story that was worth looking into. One of the first places we often look when we're doing accountability reporting um, is lobbying records and seeing what, you know, corporations, uh, in this case, Norfolk Southern, which was at fault in the accident, um, what they've been lobbying against. Um, um, so it turned out that Norfolk Southern lobbied against uh, better uh, better braking regulations, um, other safety requirements uh, governing trains carrying hazardous materials. Um, one of the other things that we found early on was that the train that derailed in East Palestine wasn't being uh, regulated as what's known as a high hazard flammable train, you know, even though it was flammable enough to um, require local evacuations. Um, and so I think we had a moment where we thought, OK, does this mean that there isn't a story here? And then we thought, actually, this is sort of an even bigger story of regulatory failures spanning multiple presidential administrations. And, and you know, just, just to add on to that point from Rebecca, I think something reporters look for are like tensions or, or rifts or things that aren't really adding up. And, you know, as Rebecca just pointed out, there were these images all over the internet of like a train on fire and a mushroom cloud over a small town in Ohio. And then we're being told by regulators, like this isn't a high hazard flammable train. And so I think when something really doesn't add up like that, or, or it seems sort of illogical, uh, or nonsensical, that, that can often be, uh, sort of an opening for a story. So, so in the case of East Palestine, it was like, there's this big disaster happening. Nobody in the Biden administration is talking about it. Um, you know, th this train wasn't being very closely regulated. Like, what exactly is going on here? You know, one of the things that we've been talking about in terms of our ongoing coverage of the yawning divides between the rich and the poor, the, failure to grapple with the extent of the climate crisis, Wall Street's predatory relationship with the real economy is, is the human impact and trying to have a narrative aspect to what our reporting is that's grounded in the real experience of humans on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I think that's what attracted all of us to this story to begin with is, you know, we, we had covered the rail negotiations and we saw that, you know, Norfolk Southern uh, was paying massive executive compensation while spending tens of billions of dollars buying back their stock. This was a perfect opportunity to both really expose what's happening on the ground, what expose the regulatory decisions or re regulatory inaction that led to this cr this disaster happening, uh, but ensuring that it has a really concrete human element uh, and is organically related to the conditions on the ground. All right. So let's dig into that initial February 8th report, since it includes so much critical context to understand like you said, how those conditions were created for a disaster like this to happen. Um, now, I know you touched on it a little bit already, but just to catch our listener up to speed, tell me a little bit about the train's braking systems and how the related safety rules uh, had been watered down by the rail industry and their lobbying uh, arm, and why the highly toxic chemical vinyl chloride that the train was carrying was not being regulated, as you mentioned, quote, a high hazard flammable train. Okay, so 
Frank, let me quickly take you back to 2007 when Norfolk Southern, the company whose train just derailed in East Palestine, was bragging to investors that it had just equipped one of its trains with this new updated braking technology known as electric electronically controlled pneumatic brakes, ECP brakes. And Norfolk Southern is bragging that these new brakes uh, can reduce stopping distances on trains by up to 60%. Uh, they do this by replacing the, the older braking system, conventional air brakes, which stop cars one at a time with this uh, updated system that uses an electronic signal to stop all the cars basically at the same time. So this, this is happening in 2007. Then in the early 2010s, there's an uptick of crude oil being shipped on trains in the U.S. Uh, during the Bakken oil boom and, and some other uh, sort of economic factors. And so the, the, the Obama administration um, is concerned about trains carrying hazardous materials. There are some high profile derailments. There, there's sort of a lot of concern about, uh, you know, trains traveling across the U.S. with crude oil and other hazardous materials. So the Obama administration moves to issue some safety rules, making these trains carrying hazardous materials safer. And, and one component of those rules was requiring these trains to be equipped with the ECP brakes that Norfolk Southern had been bragging about back in 2007. Norfolk Southern and its lobbying group turn around and fight the safety rules, specifically the ECP breaking rules, saying it would be too expensive to equip their trains with them, even though, you know, in the long run, there might be cost savings. Uh, they don't want to spend any money. They don't want these new safety regulations. At the same time, the chemical industry is lobbying against a different part of the rule, um, which sort of involves what trains would actually be subject to these safety standards. And what one federal agency, the agency in charge, uh, in charge of investigating transportation accidents, recommends the Obama administration adopt sort of a broad view of what, what a high hazard flammable train is, what type of train will be covered by this rule. This uh, recommendation included vinyl chloride, the toxic chemical release from the train that recently derailed in East Palestine. The Obama administration ignores uh, that recommendation, sides with the chemical industry lobbyists, and comes up with a very narrow definition of a hazardous train. But they do sort of um, buck the rail industry lobbyists and issue an ECP breaking rule. Uh, Norfolk Southern's lobbying group doesn't give up there. Uh, they then go to push for the rules repeal. The rule was ultimately repealed by the Trump administration. So you have a situation now in 2023 where first, as we mentioned before, the train that derailed in East Palestine was not being regulated as a high hazard flammable train, uh, in part thanks to these, you know, chemical industry lobbyists and a rule that would have required a much better braking technology at, on trains aimed at preventing or mitigating derailments was not in effect. Thank you so much, Julia. And really important to highlight that this is an issue that spans three presidential administrations. So this is not strictly speaking the Democrats' fault or the Republicans' fault. This is a story of corporate regulatory capture across multiple administrations. And that is really, really important to highlight when discussing this story. So really quickly before we continue, um, Matthew, I want to touch on what happened at the end of 2022 in regards to the railroad workers unions contract negotiations and the deal that was forced on them by Congress, which effectively broke a potential strike. So how does the story of the rail workers and their working conditions play into what happened in East Palestine? Well, yeah. I mean, the statistic I always say is is that uh, 70 years ago, there were a million people working on the rails uh, in the U.S., and now there's only a little bit over 100,000. Um, and it's carrying an enormous amount of freight. So 40% of the country's long-haul freight is transported through rail. The railroad workers had very modest demands, some paid sick leave, five days of paid sick leave, um, some real consideration of the disaster that precision scheduled railroading has been, which is just another term for types of practices we've seen in other sectors. Lean is a common name for it, but there's uh, the Toyota method is another one as well, where it's it's basically just streamlining operations on the backs of workers. How can we get more productivity, 
per work hour out of workers. And that's uh, that's what precision scheduled railroading has been. How can we make longer trains with smaller crews? Um, and yeah, you know, instead of uh, really taking the railroad workers uh, position seriously. I mean, so yes, rail union negotiations, union negotiations in the transportation sector are different than other uh, unions. They're covered by the Railway Labor Act, uh, which is much more complex, but also involves the federal government as an arbiter uh, at many more stages in the process than union negotiations that occur under the National Labor Relations Act. So the Biden administration had a very active role in these negotiations from beginning to end. Uh, and uh, the Biden administration basically just decided to split the difference between the workers' demands and the company's demands and implement more or less a status quo contract. But that failed to acknowledge you know, the decades of disinvestment into the railroad workforce um, uh, that the unions were attempting to address. So, uh, yeah, uh, railroad workers weren't having it. Uh, it led to a strike situation, uh, a potential strike, and Congress and the Biden administration decided to pass a law, uh, which is the right to do under the Railway Labor Act to prevent the workers from striking and to implement the contract, the split the baby contract that the Biden administration had helped uh, union leadership and uh, the railroad industry negotiate. Uh, since that time, there's a, it's also worth noting that there's been some uh, significant fallout inside the unions. So the longtime uh, president of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, uh, which is an affiliate of the Teamsters Union, which represents other rail workers as well, uh, was defeated in his renomination campaign by somebody who very little people knew. He he, he wasn't a major figure in the union uh, beforehand, in large part due to the negotiations um, and the way that they went down. Got it. So really a perfect storm of these railroad workers being understaffed of these companies choosing to move more and more freight with less and less staff. On top of that, these safety rules have been watered down. This chemical is not being regulated really the way that it should be. So really just kind of created like the perfect storm for something like this to happen. All right. So this first story that you all wrote goes out February 8th. Was there a moment after that or a series of moments where you all started to realize that this story was starting to get picked up by other outlets, by other journalists? Like, when did you realize that it was starting to, that people were starting to realize the the the, the import of what you all had reported on? That's a great question. You know, uh, part of the context is that th there there was some type of media silence on the issue. And it's not that there wasn't any news coverage of it. You know, again, there was a, a mushroom cloud and and it was sort of um, it, it be, being covered as like this, you know, big, crazy disaster in middle America. But, but there wasn't any real like contextual reporting on it. It was just sort of like, look at this crazy accident that happened and all these people are freaked out and evacuating. Um, and so our first story was sort of really published in that context of of a total you know lack of context about the disaster and and it it, it sort of felt like slowly um as it was sort of the, the first story to really talk about, you know, safety regulations being rolled back, uh, the buyback era of the railroads, uh, you know, the workforce is being slashed. Then it was all of a sudden like sort of politicians were tweeting out the story and um, other other outlets were sort of starting to look at uh, some of the conditions that had had laid the groundwork for the derailment. And it felt like it, it, it took a few days. And then like the first cable news hits on the East Palestine derailment came maybe like five or six days after our first story came out. I just want to say real fast, it has been really incredible to watch all of you work these past few weeks, because not only because of how damn hard you all have been working, but also watching, as we've been saying, this story drive national conversation. It's been really, really incredible to watch. Um, since then, the lever has been cited by MSNBC, HuffPo, Newsweek, The Guardian, many others. And between the three of you and David, you've all appeared on The Problem with Jon Stewart, The Takeaway, All Things Considered, Democracy Now!, Chapo Trap House, and of course, your New York Times op-ed, which I should mention was the featured story in their opinion section. So 
what has these past two weeks been like for all of you with all of this coverage, all of this attention and all of these appearances you've been doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's really interesting is just how we were able to kind of latch on to this issue uh, and then really see it pick up in a way that it hadn't beforehand. So, you know, as Julia said, it it was, you know, really days of kind of silence around this major issue until we got a hold of it. So, yeah, it's been very busy. Um, but I think that it, it's really fantastic that we've been able to get this uh, issue, the coverage that it deserves. All right. So a week goes by. At this point, public pressure is starting to mount on the Department of Transportation and its secretary, Pete Buttigieg, uh, partially because that's his job to <laughs> regulate the railroads, uh, but also because of a follow up piece that you all wrote about what actual authority he has. So. Can someone go into a little bit of detail about that? What was Pete uh, claiming was his authority versus what he could actually do? So full disclosure, I am a former resident of South Bend, Indiana. I was not a fair fan of Pete Buttigieg's uh, mayoral uh, administration, uh, but you know none of us are waging a personal vendetta here against Secretary Pete. I still have to say I'm actually still kind of shocked that it took him 10 days to say anything at all, just because that's just startlingly inept politically. Um, so, you know, it took him 10 days to say anything, including he was all on all the Sunday talk shows, you know, talking about the State of the Union address. The first thing he said on Twitter started with, I continue to be concerned. Um, <laughs> also, just poor, just on a political performance level. Um, so after that sort of initial statement, uh, you know, the first sort of lengthier statement that we saw from him um he sort of pretended not to have any regulatory power over the situation. You know, specifically, he said that he was constrained um, by a 2015 law passed um, that was what the Trump administration had used to repeal this breaking rule. Um, now, it is true that there was a 2015 law. Um, it's true that that was what the Trump administration um, or what sort of paved the way for the Trump administration repealing the breaking rule, um, we were pretty sure it was not true that uh, this meaningfully constrained him besides sort of the ordinary, um, you know, administrative procedures that regulators have to go through uh, when doing rulemaking. Um, and when we both looked back at this 2015 law that required um, the Department of Transportation to restudy the efficacy, the cost, costs and benefits of of electronic braking. Um, and then also talk to experts. We found, yeah, you know, he's a secretary of transportation. He has broad regulatory powers over transportation, uh, including the railways. Um, and these things do take time. Um, but, you know, there's no better time to start than in the wake of a horrifying rail disaster. You know, one one thing that's a tiny bit uh, understated by Rebecca because she's uh, modest, is that the Department of Transportation started like fighting with the Levers Twitter account on Twitter. We adhere to the highest standards of journalistic ethics. And so we, of course, reached out to the Department of Transportation for comment on the story, incorporated their comment, uh, which, you know, sort of went along with the fact pattern that we were reporting anyways. Um, and, and the Transportation Department started attacking our story on Twitter as false uh, without providing any, um, you know, evidence that the story was false or what was false about the story, you know, didn't ask for any corrections on the story, which would, would sort of be uh, the typical way a government agency might uh, claim that uh, th there's something false in the story. And then was like responding to Twitter accounts that had responded to our story that had like nine followers uh, sort of calling them out for, you know, misunderstanding the Department of Transportation's response to the accident. I, I've, I've never really seen anything like this from uh, a federal agency's Twitter account before. Yeah, it was like the poor little Department of Transportation movies <laughs> are hurt. You know? Well, the, the peak of our, uh, our careers be getting the DOT to respond to at Cupcake Boner on Twitter, possibly. Only time will tell. Yeah. <laughs> 
there's a lot of interesting psychology. So, it, I mean, like, obviously, like, our, you know, pure conjecture, but it is, you know, I believe in it fully, is that it was Secretary Pete who was actually using the Department of Transportation's Twitter account <laughs> to go after our story. Um, and if it wasn't him, he was certainly directly approving all the messages, you know, because I, I just refuse to believe ever. he's too press conscious to not and too much of a control freak to not kind of um, approve all of those messages. I think that what's interesting is it's I'd be really interested to know what he thinks his job actually is, um, because this is the now kind of the third round of us kind of covering transportation issues very in depth. And it just being, this is the first time, you know, that he's done anything, you know, but it's each time it was like, with the rail negotiations, it was like, where's Pete? Marty Walsh was literally everywhere, you know, with the rail negotiations. And Pete was doing what exactly, you know? Then there was the airline issue. Uh, and it was like, where's Pete, you know? And he's still, the last time I checked, so, uh, but, but it's it's certain, if he, it's possible he has now, but it took him a very long time to uh, issue fines from the holiday airline debacle. The last time I checked, which was a couple of weeks ago, he had not issued any fines yet. Um, and so I think it's, you know, really, he's just the apotheosis of this kind of Washington culture where it's like, if it's not about bombing brown people, you know, the government can't do anything, you know, (laughs) um, and shouldn't do anything. And it's, it's inconceivable to act like the government could or would or should do something until, you know, you're forced to by like, you know, a major national outrage, then you can kind of do something because it's clear that the authorizing statutes, not only, you know, tell you that you can do something, but that you should do (laughs) something. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, the statement that came out today is it's, I mean, it's a huge vindication for our work. You know, he has said he's committed to rulemaking on ECP breaks. He's committed to rulemaking on HHFT uh, trains. Um, It's a significant step forward, but yeah. Well, let's get into that statement because that has been the most movement from Pete and the Department of Transportation so far. So just today, we're recording this on Tuesday. um, After weeks of building public pressure, Secretary Pete appeared on Good Morning America with George Stephanopoulos to make this announcement. But there's another side to the story, which is making sure that we move forward on rail safety in this country. The NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, is an independent body and they are independently doing their investigative work. But we don't have to wait for their final report to know that some things need to change. And so today, we are pushing forward a three-part drive on rail safety. Things that we're doing at the Department of Transportation to raise the bar. Things that we need help from Congress to do in order to hold rail companies accountable. And things that this industry needs to do differently. i got to tell you, ever since I came into this job, I have seen the power that multi-billion dollar railroad companies wield and they fight safety regulations tooth and nail that's got to change the future cannot be like the past and i am calling for that change to begin right away you're beginning saying it should begin right away but uh, ohio senator jd vance has said that the administration was loosening rail re- regulations <laughs> No, I'm happy to talk with him more if uh, he wants to understand the work that we're doing. I mean, whenever you whenever you play these clips, I, it's so fascinating to me because I never, you know, I, I don't I don't listen to this. Uh, you know, I usually just read and he audibly gulped <laughs> before he said multi-billion dollar railroad. It pained him. It made him nervous. <laughs> Yeah, it made him nervous. He audibly gulped. He's like, oh, no, are the cor- my corporate Don't say the B word. Don't say the B word. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, I mean, 
what do you all think about this announcement? Is he is he finally rising to the occasion? Is this is this lip service? What what, what do we what do yeah, we make of I this? I mean, okay, so two things. Number one, uh, we don't have to wait until the completion of this inspection to know that something fundamental needs to change. That's like a very easy day one statement to make, and also the complete opposite of what he has been saying in all of his previous statements, which is we are going to wait until. Uh, the, you know, conclusion of this investigation. I think it's undeniable that without the pressure, you know, from our reporting, from uh, now the broader reporting that's broken out from this, this kind of statement would not have happened. Even so, you know, I'm just looking at the list of things uh, that the Department of Transportation is is saying it's going to do. Um, you know, the first the first column is what they're calling on Norfolk Southern to do. Uh, number one is encouraging uh, Norfolk Southern to join a close call reporting program where um, railroads and employees can report unsafe events. You know, again, this is something uh, that if he wanted to, and I I believe he's been encouraged by rail unions to do, he could make this mandatory. He doesn't just have to ask the railroad nicely um, to please let employees report when trains might crash in the future. I was just going to say very level answer from Rebecca. And and the only thing I would add is just like what an about face that is from how he was, you know, first silent for 10 days, then saying like, oh, we're constrained, you know, Congress should act if they want to. And then just within a couple of days, calling out the railroad industry and saying that he does have, you know, uh, executive authority to do something. Again, to Rebecca's point, like there's uh, until uh, sort of comprehensive rulemaking has happened, um, you know, until he's actually done something, there's not anything to like celebrate necessarily. But but it's just a remarkable shift that can only happen, you know, sort of under immense pressure. And I think the lever did play a big role in that. Yeah, I think that's right, you know, as well. I think it's, you know, the other question is the devil in the details. So uh, I had missed that Railroad Workers United um, had published back in September a very trenchant critique of uh, the administration's proposed rule on a minimum of two-person train crew rules, which he brought up again in this statement today, saying we're going to move forward on the minimum two-person train crew rules, which has been a huge priority of the unions. It's obviously a huge safety issue as well. One-person trains is a crazy idea. The The Railroad Workers United group is saying, you know, there's huge holes, basically, in, in this, this rule uh, that need to be addressed. And so that's the question with all of this stuff is um, – is how comprehensive is it going to be in the details? I think the other thing that, you know, we'll be continuing to do is, you know, the the the, the typical approach is that the railroad industry litigates any type of meaningful regulation whatsoever. And so I think that's why it's also very important and, and we will be continuing to be paying very close attention to what the railroads are doing, what the railroad lobbies are doing It seems like this is a moment where they can be shamed into not litigating kind of new rules. Um, But we really, you know, we need to kind of stay focused on it. And that's why anybody listening to this should give us money so that we can have more resources to (laughs) pay attention to this issue. Yeah. And unlike some reporters on Twitter, we are not fundraising off of a disaster, but rather to continue doing this kind of work, which is reporting on the people and corporations responsible for disasters like this. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more from the Levers reporters. Welcome back to Lever Time. So everyone, before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about the response that we've been getting to this story, both positive and negative. So let's start with start with the bad news. Let's start with the negative first. So watching the coverage of the Lever story play out has been a real time lesson in the influence of partisan politics. So can someone go into a little bit of detail about the response we've been seeing from Democratic Party operatives as well as voters, specifically how folks have felt the need to defend Secretary Pete rather than pressuring him to do his job? Yeah, I think, you know, this whole saga has kind of been a health check on 
the Democratic Party and where they're at and the prognosis is is not great. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think we've seen the right sort of predictably latch on to this issue um, and, you know, propose that there's some sort of a conspiracy happening where this is being ignored because East Palestine is, you know, a, a, a white uh town that the area voted overwhelmingly for Trump. Of course, that's not true. Unfortunately, this kind of delayed and uh, callous response is par for the course, you know, that we've seen, particularly in communities of color from Flint to, you know, East Chicago, you know, at the lever in our coverage, um, you know, have said, here's under the Obama administration, how an important opportunity was missed. Here's under the Trump administration, how the regulations were gutted completely. Now we're in the Biden administration. Fun fact, what's happening? Um, just that line of questioning um, really got people mad. Uh, and I think, it, you know, it kind of continues to be shocking to me um, how many people, either in good faith or not, uh, suggest that regular regulators don't have, you know, any authority to regulate, uh, you know, that it, it has to be up to Congress. And of course, well, we can't pass things through Congress because Republicans. Yeah, I mean, I think I that's very similar take to Rebecca's, to be sure. I think it's, you know, it's been interesting to, on the flip side, you know, to see how some Republicans, Marco Rubio, J.D. Vance, have kind of latched on to the facts behind our reporting. Um, and and then the response by liberals in turn, but then, you know, the, the complicated factors behind Senate Republicans advocating for accountability when their whole approach to the federal government is to abolish the regulatory state and funnel all of our money, taxpayer dollars into the military industrial complex and not a penny for anything else. Um, I think it's very cynical <laughs> on their part. I think there's been a ton of cynicism on kind of both sides. I, you know, I think, again, going back to our earlier discussion, I think the one thing that's hopeful is that even with a, in the context of this enormous cynicism, which is, you know, frankly, to be expected, we knew that, you know, there's a ton of cynicism in American politics. The fact that our even in, even despite that, even despite the polarization, the fact that this reporting is making an impact is is very heartening. All right. And finally, I want to get back to the community of East Palestine and the people who live there, because ultimately they are the ones who have been suffering through this disaster. So what has been done in terms of disaster relief to help residents? And what, if anything, has Norfolk Southern, which is the rail carrier, done to help the community? So there were initially um, some paltry payments from Norfolk Southern to the town of East Palestine, which I think amounted to $5 per resident. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. And, and, and they got a lot of flack for that. But, but perhaps the more interesting thing, you know, has been Norfolk Southern's um, involvement in testing efforts after the disaster. Um, there was a really great story in the Huffington Post this weekend about how the initial tests on uh, the water of East Palestine for it to be uh, determined that it was safe were conducted by a consultant paid by Norfolk Southern that didn't comply with EPA regulations and that Governor DeWine actually declared the water to be safe based on those tests um, before uh, sort of the official um, EPA test had declared it to be safe. I know that Norfolk Southern has also been involved in some of the testing um, within homes uh, to sort of declare that they're safe for people to return to. And of course, people haven't trusted that very much. Uh, there's, there's, you know, it's been interesting speaking with residents. Perhaps it would have been obvious, but there's a huge amount of anger, you know, directed towards Norfolk Southern. People don't see this as like some unusual accident. They really seem to see it as the product of corporate malfeasance, which obviously, you know, as our reporting has detailed, you know, it is. It's about um, greed and and returning uh, money to shareholders at the expense of, you know, investments in, in the workforce in in safer technologies. Um, and and so it's been very interesting to see. Uh, both that Norfolk Southern has sort of had a role in, in, in telling people that things are safe and completely unsurprising that, you know, people wouldn't believe that. Yes, I think it's also important to note that, you know, 
there have now been numerous reports of animals dying, livestock dying, residents feeling sick. So what what do we think is is happening here? Is this like potential government ineptitude? Is is it possible that officials, you know, maybe know a little bit more about the contamination that they're letting on? What do we what do we think is happening at this point? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to speculate, you know, I mean, I think that we do know that the EPA failed catastrophically after 9-11, uh, that the EPA failed in Flint, Michigan, that there's ongoing public health crises, that the government is not working hard enough to mitigate. Inertia is kind of the name of the game when it comes to communities being poisoned because it's happening every day across the, America. I think that the residents are totally warranted to be skeptical of what the state and federal governments are doing. I think we need to shine as clear a light as possible on what's happening. I think these concerns about testing are worth some additional reporting, and, and we'll be looking into that. Uh, and um, it's a very common thing when there's a crisis that involves government malfeasance, you know, there's the whole herd mentality uh, and the whole kind of crisis turtle, you know, mode <laughs> that uh, they get into. Um it's not only bad for the public and bad for the public trust. Usually it's it's also not really legal either, but they do it anyway because there's not uh, there's not accountability. Just to add to that, you know, without speculating about this particular situation, I think what we know really clearly from, again, Flint, East Chicago, environmental after disaster after environmental disaster, is that the parties at fault are going to do everything they can to limit their liability and how much they pay out. Um, and that government agencies often have been complicit in that. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, The Intercept had this really interesting article yesterday um, looking more in depth at the vinyl industry's kind of role in this. And, you know, I mean, one th it sent me down an interesting rabbit hole about like the whole push for PVC piping, which is a, kind of a major thing that vinyl chloride is used to do is, is doesn't actually even make that much sense. Like there's really significant advantages, you know, particularly from an environmental perspective to clay piping, which is what human beings have used for sewer systems for literally thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, you know, that's definitely another area. Well, the one, one essential point on that is that the production of the the vinyl chloride is incredibly toxic as well for workers and communities. So that's definitely, I think, something we'll be looking into as well. You know, one fact just to foreshadow some future reporting that we'll do, be doing is that Warren Buffett is also one of the largest uh, producers of, of vinyl chloride in addition to owning one of the largest railroads that ships vinyl chloride. He doesn't own Norfolk Southern, Southern. he owns BNSF, but that's, that's another kind of fascinating threat that I think we'll be digging into some more. All right. So looking forward, where do we go from here? Do do we think that the Biden administration or Pete Buttigieg's Department of Transportation will actually follow through on some of these changes? Are we just getting lip service while people are angry? Has there been any substantive movement? Uh, what what is what is progress looked like up until this point? Just to echo what Matthew said earlier, I think in some ways this is like uh, a very heartening proof of concept that, um, you know, raising the profile of an issue, hammering away at it with real accountability journalism uh, gets a response. The response hasn't gone far enough yet. Um, you know, again, uh, we see the Department of Transportation sort of suggesting things that it could require. Um, so, yeah, well, we and hopefully others will continue to keep this in the spotlight uh, because I think that is definitely what it's going to take. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's really great kind of the work that, that environmental groups have, as Rebecca reported on Friday, have started to kind of jump on this. I think that's really essential to kind of keeping this in the public consciousness is kind of, yeah, you know, like we can't do it alone. You know, we, you know, there needs to, and, and like our readers can't do it alone either. There needs to be kind of other people kind of organizing and pushing this issue, you know, to ensure that 
that both the broader public and also, frankly, you know, people in the disaster zone, you know, are aware of kind of the solutions as well. Like that is that is an organizing kind of problem and solution, you know, that that hopefully folks are are ready to take up. And, and again, yeah, Rebecca's article on Friday really kind of hopefully points points the way for some future action on uh, on this front. All right. Well, thank you all so, so much. I just want to close out by reiterating that it has been really amazing to watch you all work these past weeks. And I am extremely proud to be part of an organization that does this type of investigative journalism. You know, corporate media rarely reports on how money influences our political system in these substantive ways and how that influence can lead to disasters like this train derailment. And you know, the lever has truly lived up to its namesake and moved the levers of power. And you all should be extremely proud of the work that you've done. So thank you again. And thank you for taking a lot of time today with me to talk about it. Thanks, Frank. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Frank. This was fun. That's it for today's show. As a reminder, our paid subscribers who get Lever Time Premium will get to hear our bonus segment, my interview with independent journalist John Russell, who has been on the ground in East Palestine for the last couple of weeks speaking with railroad workers and union leaders about this train derailment disaster. I can tell you that there is a lot of rage at the fact that this $55 billion company detonated a toxic train in the middle of town and offered not one, but several insultingly low sums of money to make up for it. Listeners can subscribe to Lever Time Premium by heading over to levernews.com. When you subscribe, you also get access to all of the Lever's website, our weekly newsletters, our live events, and all of our premium content. And that is all for the criminally low price of just $8 a month, which is half the price of a standard Netflix account. One last favor, please be sure to like, subscribe, and write a review for Lever Time on your podcast app. And make sure to head over to levernews.com and check out all of the incredible reporting that our team has been doing. Until next time, I am Frank Capello. Rock the boat. <laughs>